Dr. Beatty. Uh, he's an associate professor Professor of Instructional Technologies in the Department of Equity, Leadership Studies in Instructional Technologies at San Francisco State University. His primary areas of interest in research include social interaction and online learning, flipped classroom implementation, and developing instructional design theory for hybrid flexible learning environments. At SFSU, uh, Dr. Beatty uh, pioneered the development and evaluation of the HyFlex course design model that we're about to learn about today for blended learning environments, implementing a student-directed hybrid approach to better support student learning. So thank you for jo joining us today, Dr. Beatty. Uh, I'm gonna hand the reins right on over to you, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Coming through strong, great, great, super. All right. Um, well, thank you for in inviting me to, to speak to you about uh, HyFlex. It's something I've been talking a lot about uh, really for the last 15 years, but especially the last, uh, I don't know, eight months or so uh, for some obvious reasons. Um, and so what I'll, I'll do today is kind of give you the background of kind of what we started, why we started it, how it's worked for us, and, and uh, some, of the, some of the basic ideas that we try to make sure are, are part of the conversation around HyFlex, especially as we're looking forward to transitioning at some point out of our current situation into a more more normal, but a different normal for us. I think we all know that um, things are going to be different uh, moving forward, um, uh, maybe not in every case, but in many cases. And so we wanna be prepared for that. And I think HyFlex can give us some, uh, some more, so take, allow us to take advantage of the opportunities that we have even more so. so uh, this presentation I have uh, prepared for you, I will share with you as well. It's a lot longer than uh, even I can can get to in 60 minutes as a professor. Uh, so I'm going to skip around a little bit. And I also want to, uh, after after the first, you know, kind of level setting, uh, if you have questions, specific questions about HyFlex that you'd like me to talk to, uh, please put those in the chat. And we'll try to get to in the, as many of those as we can. Uh, and you can follow up with me afterwards by email as well. And I can often find questions or answers uh, or, or point you to people who maybe have better answers than I do. Uh, like Jamie said, this is basically my background. I have a lot of a big variety in, in the areas I've been doing uh, education and training for really the last 30 years or so, including high school teaching. I taught uh, high school math, science, and computers and uh, military training. I was in the, the Navy in the nuclear power program for my right out of college. I have an engineering degree. And so, you know, kind of problem solving is part of what, what I try to look for. Uh, and so I have this kind of a, a background and I've been a, an administrator and a faculty member at San Francisco State for, you know, for over 15 years now. So I've seen a lot of different things. And so I understand the complexities of uh, the instructional environment and how how challenging it is to to talk about teaching in a different way, uh, especially with faculty who've been teaching this way and actually or teaching in their own way, single mode online or most likely in the classroom and doing quite well. Uh, for the most part for, for, you know, sometimes decades, you know, so there is also, there's a book out there uh, we released in October of 2019, Open Educational Resource Licensed uh, Creative Commons. And so you can find that too. And a lot of what uh, my approach that I've developed over the years is kind of captured in that book, as well as a lot of case studies from other universities or, or colleges uh, around the country, and even a couple from international places. Um, so the, the talk I have arranged Usually I talk about kind of what is high flex, but then we talk about supporting students, supporting faculty, and uh, looking at administrative structures that we need, you know, supports that we need in order to do this. And so that's generally how the slides are arranged. Um, real quickly, high flex, just to make sure we're on the same page, high flex means essentially a combination of an online class and a face-to-face -face class into a single learning community, right? So a single class that includes multiple participation modes. Sometimes the online is synchronous, sometimes it's asynchronous. Uh, in many cases, it's both. Uh, and then the face-to-face -face classroom is what the face-to-face -face classroom is and probably always has been. Uh, and the, the, the point of the flexibility is that students get a chance to choose which mode of participation is the best for them at any particular point in time, the best as they define it, not necessarily as, as we in the academic uh, you know, kind of leadership roles would necessarily define it. But, you know, the point is that leaving the choice up to students it actually provides, uh, you know, some agency and, uh, you know, some control and some interesting things for students, even though it comes with risks, of course. At San Francisco State, when we started uh, developing this approach after, you know, after a year or two, when it became clear that this was working for, 
for us or some of us at least, and uh, we were going to continue to do this, we needed to put a definition in place. And so our academic senate was actually creating our first online educational policy at the time. This is, you know, in the probably around 2008, 2009, these conversations started. And we came up with a simple definition and we've changed it uh, twice. This is the latest, latest uh, rendition, uh, you know, it, that we just did like two months ago in the academic senate. It basically says students can choose to attend class online or in an assigned face-to-face -face environment. And if it's online, it could be synchronous, asynchronous, or bichronous, which is obviously a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. I say obviously um, just because this has become part of our, our language since I think April was when I first saw this uh, term being used. Right now, I don't teach any high flex courses because I don't, I'm not available for the classroom or this classroom's not available to me or to my students to teach. And so I teach totally bichronous now. Uh, I teach an online class that's students can participate in synchronous or asynchronous. I still use the principles of HyFlex. And so when I'm available or when the classroom is available to me again, uh, I'll be back in the classroom, but also allowing students to participate online, uh, you know, as an alternative to the classroom. And for some of them, it's not really an alternative. It's their primary mode of what they'd like to do. When we started doing HyFlex, we came up with four key principles that we wanted to implement. And so I've stuck with these for the last 15 years. A lot of places that have done high flex have used the same principles. Some have changed to use their own term rather than high flex. They come up with a local, a local name. And then they, and they also come up with their own principles. They're often very similar. Sometimes they replace one or two with, um, you know, with, um, you know, uh, other values really that they think are more important to them, or they rename one of these to kind of um, emphasize things that they want to, you know, more emphasize with their students and with their faculty on their own campuses. So the key principles, you can see them here on the screen. I'll go through each one real briefly, but alternatives essentially just means that we have fully developed participation alternatives, fully developed. In other words, students can make that choice. And when they make that choice, as a faculty member, I don't have to scramble to say, oh, okay, you want to do this. You're not able to come to class. What can I give you to do kind of to make up for the class time you're missing? It's not that way at all. It's, it's already prepared for you. It's okay. There's a pathway there. And actually, in many cases, you can actually look at that ahead of time as you're making your decision as to whether you want to be in class or online. All right. So there are fully developed participation alternatives. And uh, the next one is equivalence, of course. And what that means is that no matter which path you choose, you should be able to meet the same learning outcomes, right? Equivalent learning outcomes. These are not process outcomes. Right, so these are not, you're gonna do exactly the same things online as you do in class. That's sometimes that happens, but oftentimes it's different or, it, or it's not the same activities. And even when they are the same activities by name, like discussions, uh, we have to admit that the online discussion, especially asynchronously that students participate in is gonna be a different experience than the classroom discussion or even the online synchronous discussion. The synchronicity, the dynamic nature of the you know, the in-class or the synchronous online discussion is very different than an asynchronous discussion. The asynchronous discussion has different advantages and disadvantages to it, right? But each one can learn to lead to equivalent learning outcomes. So if we focus on the learning outcomes and we, when we're making our decisions, especially about whether or not we can use HyFlex well or not, and then how do we design for it, I think we're more likely to be successful uh, in, a, in a pragmatic way, as in, as in a, a way that doesn't, um, you know, require us to uh, to do you know two or three times as much work to make this all happen. The third principle I'd like to follow is the principle of reuse. And this actually has implications for faculty workload and student workload uh, you know, uh, as well. So when I do something in the classroom with students, I wanna take all those materials and all those activities and somehow make them available to the online students as well and vice versa. The things I do for the online students or with the online students, I want the classroom students to be able to find some value in that as well. Sometimes this is optional value. In other words, it's available for you like a recording from the class. Uh, is that required for online students to review in order to, you know, to be counted as participating in class that week? Well, in some cases it might be, and in other cases it might not be. But in, in any way, in any case, if I can do a recording from the classroom and make it available to online students, it's there for those who need it uh, or who want it. Uh, and I always, t I always have students who tell me that they find it valuable. And then there are other students who clearly don't find it valuable in, in that, you know, the logs say they never look at them. And so as a faculty member, part of my design decision is, well, do I want to require that or tell them it's required, you know, give them some sort of participation points for watching those videos. Uh, you know, so those are the kinds of things that we would try to do, but also the artifacts, right? So when online students are 
doing some sort of a, an activity and creating some some sort of artifact, you know, maybe it's a it's a draft document of some sort and posting that online. Well, those are should be available to the to face to face students, and I would even design for them to be it brought back into the classroom at the next time we meet to say, oh, well, here's what we've been doing online as well. So students know that there are, there are more people, you know, in this class than just them there. And then we get a chance to kind of do this reuse. So what we end up with essentially is two things. We end up with a little bit of a richer learning environment, at least the possibility for that with students, because it's not just what I do in the classroom or not just what I do online, but I can also find some value in what other students are doing in the interactions that they're having. But also as a faculty member, I don't have to teach two different classes. I teach one class. I create one set of materials, one set of engagement strategies. And the more I can make those the same engagement strategies, then kind of the easier it is for me. Uh, you know, one of the big challenges of HyFlex, and you'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll talk about this, and we can talk a little bit more about this later, uh, is the workload issue for faculty. And so is this two classes? Is it more than two classes to teach if I have three different modes? Well, clearly, there's no way I would be teaching that way. Uh, and I would never have encouraged others to do so as well. There is more work involved. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about design because you have to design the async and build the asynchronous online course unless someone's gonna build it for you, which is a pretty rare thing. Um, and, then, and then if you're gonna have asynchronous students, you have to be able to engage with them throughout the week. So the more I can reuse things, the more we can reuse in my time, the more efficient I become uh, and the more I can do this in the long term successfully. The other important thing, of course, is accessibility. And I, I, I felt that it was important to bring this in. And it's not just the accessibility that we have to meet because of the kind of our legal requirements, the federal and state and, and probably uh, system requirements uh, to provide alternative forms of expression and engagement and, and assessment for students, but also the need to provide access for students who want to use these technologies to access the class and maybe a synchronous engagement is better for them than the classroom for some particular reason. But if they don't have the resources to do so, then uh, the question becomes, well, what can we do to help support them? Can we provide, you know, long term laptop checkouts or some other technology? Can we provide them with information about where they can find a local high speed network if that's going to be required and they don't have it at home? Uh, those kinds of things. Can we provide them the skills they need to be good online learners? Not every student starts out being a good online learner, just like every teacher doesn't start out being a good online teacher. And so accessibility, I think we have to we have to think more broadly about this. And this is becoming one of the, I think one of the most important things that HyFlex can actually do for us long term is to increase access uh, to educational opportunities and environments and, uh, for students uh, as long as we we do it well. We do it strategically. We do it with resources. Um, and we do it um, uh, with patience as well. Okay, there's uh, HyFlex is the term I started using in 2005, actually probably 2006, is, is, that's the first time I ever presented with it. But there are other people doing this with other words. Above the line are, one, are, are examples I found, this was, this was all like January before, before COVID hit. Uh, but that I found in the literature that we're using essentially the same techniques and including an emphasis on providing flexibility for students and student choice. There are also lots of other uh, places that have been doing uh, more like blended synchronous learning or, or, or bimodal learning, but doesn't really, they don't really seem to emphasize the student choice in this. Perhaps all of the online students are remote learners and there's really no, no opportunity for them to be local. So, you know, you wouldn't really design for that if no one's ever going to take that option. Or it could just be uh, completely synchronous. Um, but the idea is that you have a synchronous remote location and a synchronous local location, you know, in person. Uh, and so those are different approaches that are very similar and they use a lot of the same principles and yet they're, they're, they're slightly different. So, but there's a lot of other people who have been doing work in this area, uh, really in the same general time frame. When we talk about the student and faculty experiences, I always like to show a little little graphic of what it looks in my class. So I start out with students in a particular week and uh, in the classes I teach, I teach primarily graduate seminars. Um, we have some undergraduate courses in our program, but I, since I was, most of those were developed when I was an administrator and I haven't had an opportunity to teach those yet. I've been back in the classroom for uh, finishing my second semester. Uh, just, I came back just in time for our current situation. Uh, but when I teach the classes, I usually have most of my students, half or more, Overall, 60% essentially is the number I come up with uh, in class every week. 
right? Our students are regionally located uh, for the most part. Uh, but then I do have a lot of online participation. And usually that's a split between uh, online asynchronous and online synchronous. We didn't start with synchronous uh, opportunities. When we started HyFlex, we, had a, we didn't have a synchronous platform that we could really rely on you know, for a number of years. But when we did bring that in, then we gave that option to students for the most part in many classes. This, but the next week, the next time I offered the class, if I'm doing a graduate course, it's once a week. I found that I had similar numbers, but oftentimes, you know, there might be a shift more online, especially if something was going on uh, in the culture that would, you know, that would, students didn't want to have to take that time to travel to class or some other reason. Uh, but it wasn't always the same students online and it wasn't always the same students in class. Many of the students who were in class stayed in class and, and uh, didn't, didn't seem to need to take advantage of the online. And many of the students who were participating online were always online, but certainly not all of them. I had about 10 to 15% of my students making that choice from week to week. And what that told me is that there were enough students who were finding some value in being able to make the switch that uh, it was something, I felt like it was something important for me to do as long as I could you know, practically do it if I had the resources, the time, and the kind of the expertise to do so. When uh, we talk about the student and faculty experience, we really can't avoid the technology uh, uh, challenges, you know, not, you know, the things that we need, you know, and in the, each mode, each one has a little bit different characteristics. All of them need a learning management system and the technologies associated with it, because that has to be the core uh, starting point for where students get information, where they get links, uh, where they find resources, uh, where, they, where their engagement essentially begins, and in many cases stays within. Uh, I always use the learning management system technologies, and I don't use very many technologies outside of that because I want, it to keep it, I want to keep it simple for myself, but also for students. I want them to have support. Uh, so if they have a question about how to use something in the LMS, well, I have, we have a whole team that's, that's there to support the students in that. If I use external technologies, I have to become that technology support, or I have to make sure they find it from the vendor. And sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Of course, students also need access to the network and their devices and things like that, because we're using more and more technology uh, to these days, even in our classroom instruction. So to the extent you use that, you need that for all, the, all your modes. In the classroom mode, the real thing that changes, I think, is the audio and video stream from the class. Uh, you know, One thing that could probably put, put in there is, is the Wi-Fi network. Your Wi-Fi networks in your schools, like in our school, we had Wi-Fi available across campus, but we didn't have enough Wi-Fi available in every classroom. So if I had a class of 20 or 30 students, and I all of a sudden started expecting all of them to connect uh, and do some things in the synchronous environment, you know, uh, during class, sometimes that was a challenge. And so we've had to kind of, kind of uh, add some more access points and things like that over time. In the online synchronous mode, well, clearly they need the audio and video stream from the class, but they also be able to have to be able to provide their own audio and video stream back into the class for it to be a good engaging environment for them. And so, so for some students, that's, you know, that's a challenge. Um, uh, and it, it's not just the, uh, it's not just, I mean, it's the technology, but it's also kind of the environment. Is that a technology? Not really, but it's part of the, what they have to be, what we have, they have to be able to, to manage as well. Uh, web conferencing application, of course, whether it's, uh, you know, Zoom or WebEx or uh, what other, whatever else people are using these days, um, that has to be available to be used. And then for the online asynchronous mode, you know, pretty much we, it will rely on a lot of these other technologies. Uh, but the, the big difference is we need to be able to record audio and video for presentations and videos and things like that, both going out to students, but also coming back to students. Uh, a lot of classes will have students do some sort of capturing of their own presentations of ideas or projects, et cetera. Uh, maybe as part of quizzing and testing as well. And so that has to be something that's available to students. And so I have to think kind of th through some solutions along those fronts. When, when I, we teach in classrooms, we have a variety of classrooms. This is one of the classrooms I teach in. Uh, and this is a, an active learning classroom we, we kind of put together a few years ago. Um, and the big thing about active learning here is that it, we can move things around and we've got screens around the room. But for high flex, the key important parts are really the audio and the video. Uh, and so uh, we have a, a wall-mounted camera, or a, I guess it's a ceiling-mounted camera in the very back of the room. And that allows me to, to switch and toggle between or add in, you know, a whole room view, as well as the, you know, the presenter view that I would have coming from the camera, like much like I have here uh, in this presentation. And then I have a teaching station, you know, pretty standard teaching station, nothing special there. I can plug in a laptop, uh, a tablet, even a, a phone if I have the right adapter. And I have one-button control 
for the audio system, uh, basically the AV, AV for the class, which controls the stream in and out through, or I guess out through our, um, our Zoom uh, connection. We just use some simple wireless table mics, a sh little Shure system, uh, a couple of lav mics for the presenters, for the faculty member, and maybe a student or another guest presenter. Uh, and it worked quite well. Uh, it took us three or four different generations of technology, of audio solutions to make this work, to capture student audio. And this solution seems to work very well for us as long as we have the, the microphones charged. They haven't walked away uh, in a couple of years. And so that's working well too. Um, there are lots of other simple solutions. What I, one of the things that I learned was that sometimes I don't get the chance to teach in the classroom even when I'm assigned to it, something might happen. Like the alarm goes off and I can't get it shut off and our security uh, people are not available to help for some reason. So I have to go into another room that I might have a key to. Well, then I have to have my own technology if it's not installed. And most of our other classrooms don't have technology like that installed. So I, I create, I build it, I, I brought a, you know, a simple web camera that I carry around, a simple conference microphone that I carry around, uh, you know, $50 or something like that. And each one works well enough for my relatively small classes of 20 to 25 students. Although for a larger class that, you know, clearly you need a little bit more more substantial uh, solution for that. But the point is that you don't necessarily have to have uh, a lot of expensive technology to make this work well enough for students to achieve those learning outcomes. Is it perfect? Of course not. Nothing I design is ever perfect. Um, I, we try to do the best we can, but sometimes the best we can, you know, might look like a laptop camera that's being used and turned around from, you know, as a conversation happens in the class, not elegant. Um, is it, does it work well enough? Well, as long as you capture the audio well, uh, it can be useful for students to learn from, All right? So another other solutions, the owl, OWL camera, a lot of people have used this, especially in smaller classrooms. This, these are some kind of some stock photos of it, uh, but there are a lot of schools who are using owls when they can get them, uh, you know, like a lot of things this last six months or so, a lot of things have been back recorded, uh, but it seems to work uh, pretty well for some, some situations. Uh, this is another solution that's been used in HyFlex. This is kind of on the high end side. This was a, a university in Belgium that was using this for a master's and teaching program. And what they were trying to do, like some other people in the blended synchronous uh, world at, at primarily, is they're trying to provide so, uh, an experience for the faculty that's a lot more like students in the classroom. In other words, they have larger pictures of students, not just a little windows on a screen like I might have here or presented on the, the screen behind me, the projection. Uh, they have them in the back of the room. And so students can actually be seen by the faculty member as if they were a, a regular member, a regular member of the class. And so they they really like this approach. It's a it's a pretty high cost approach, and it, it requires more technology assistance usually to get it started. Um, and yet it might be something that is done in special classrooms for, for special situations. Uh, I, I know other institutions in the United States where they'll they'll kind of find something a little bit differently. Maybe they'll have a single screen in the back that has all the, the remote students' pictures on it, right? They'll, they'll invest more, a little more in their technology um, uh, so that the experience for faculty is better. And hopefully that would translate into a better experience for students. If you're interested in the, the, the more of the blended synchronous approach, which I'll oftentimes focus on higher technology solutions, but, but also focusing more on that presence uh, capability and using technology to support that, I would recommend taking a look at the case studies in the blended synchronous learning uh, website. This is from Australia, uh, funded research for many, many years. A another place that uh, you may be familiar with already is FlexSpace. When you're looking at space design, technology design, uh, this was a this is a you know kind of a kind of a, a website that puts together lots of different examples of uh, of uh, space solutions contributed from people mostly in the North America, uh, but probably some others as well by now. And lots of different things you can search from. It's a free, you can you can join us. I'm not sure if, um, if SUNY's been part of this. It started with California State University System, San Diego State, uh, uh, the Frazee, Rebecca Frazee and, and a lot of colleagues down there. Anyway, uh, a great resource, thousands of different entries in here, including a bunch now for uh, social distance and some for high flex as well. Excuse when we me, talk Ryan. about high flex for a student, we try to keep it pretty simple, right? So in my syllabus, I might have a paragraph like this. And for, in, in my classes, most of the students who take me more than, you know, when they have more than one of my classes, they know what high flex is the way I teach it. Uh, but it's not exactly the same as high flex someone else, the way someone else teaches it in my own department. Uh, another faculty member prefers synchronous. 
uh, and does not like to have students participating asynchronously because you know this faculty really wants to emphasize that synchronous nature and wants to do things live in class that aren't aren't as easily replicated in an asynchronous environment and so their language would be different it would focus much more on this the synchronous you know so if you want to be online you have to be synchronous um, other faculty do not like the synchronous environment online environment so they will they will basically say hey you've you will have a class meeting, and if you're not able to meet that class meeting, well, then there's an asynchronous version of the course that you can complete, for, um, you know, that week, um, and that's the requirement. Others like me will often give them um, both choices uh, if we can do it and we find some value in it. But there are other places that do this more broadly. Uh, Pierce College was one of the first ones I was aware of that did this really systematically at an institutional level, and so they have a whole website about uh, about HyFlex for them. They call it Pierce Fit. Um, that was their, their way of branding it, but it's very, it's very, it's basically high flex. Um, when I was the department chair, actually in my department, I had a lot more information on, uh, on what high flex meant for, for people, students in the iTech department. And then, you know, through internal politics and stuff, that whole website went away as we moved into another department. And so we're still kind of rebuilding our own communication approach. So, uh, I don't have this again yet, but we'll get to it. Uh, another this is an example from another university. This is in, uh, down in Virginia. Uh, they just started this this summer. We did some workshops with them in the summer and they, they launched this in the fall. And so they call their approach Shenflex, right? So they're kind of branding it for their own university and they use a little different, they actually, they're one of the ones that changed some of the principles because it better fit for them. So focusing more on students, uh, one of the things that students really value, not surprisingly, is they like to have the flexibility of choosing when they want it, when they can be in class and when they can be online. Some students, really have no choice. I mean, if they're remotely located, then, you know, if we don't have an online option for them, then they're probably not able to take our classes. They may not even be able to roll in our institution, right? So clearly there's an, an advantage there for students remote, but even students who are, who are, who are local uh, sometimes need this, especially when they have complicated schedules. They have work schedules, they have family care schedules, et cetera. And these days, you know, everything's up in the air. So uh, the better we can do, the better, or, or the better. Uh, anyway, uh, sometimes students will also tell me they like the richer learning environment because they can, if they're an online student, you know, they would not normally not have that conversation recorded from the classroom that they could listen to that includes the voice of the instructor, perhaps other experts, but also the students. Uh, sometimes, you know, often, you know, who would, who would record that beforehand? Probably pretty rarely would we be recording those if we didn't have an online set of students that we wanted to support in some particular way that way. Uh, another thing that actually works out well for students who are normally face-to-face -face is they get a chance to try out the online environment, sometimes because of necessity, sometimes just because they're interested in it, but they don't have to fully commit to a totally online class. You know, for some of them, that's a kind of a scary proposition. Now, maybe that's going to continue to change. And since they're all online, you know, some of them are probably finding it that they like this online environment. Many are probably finding it that they hate this online environment. So we'll have to see how the, how the, you know, how that kind of, how they bring that back into you know the environment when we're back in the in the classroom and maybe giving them options so those are some of the important things that they value you know they really they have to know how they have to attend class in order and what they have to do that has to be very clear for them this is one of the things they really talk about uh when i asked students about this this was a number of years ago but we recorded some interviews with students about three minutes each so you can see these links you can have this they're available in the book too one of the things they all talk about is that when the audio didn't work in the classroom it really hindered their experience as an online student uh, watching the recording later. And that doesn't mean that it stopped them from learning if they couldn't hear something being said in class, but it meant that the experience was uh, not nearly as effective. And what it can lead to is them just to kind of ignoring that resource, that online dynamic uh, conversation that you've recorded that's no longer dynamic, but it's still there um, in the future. And so I think it's an important uh, part of that. Uh, but we have to realize that sometimes the technology doesn't work. Sometimes, I mean, I've, I've forgotten to hit record before. Uh, sometimes I do re automatic recording, but occasionally I'd, I'd forget. So there's no recording. So I have to be careful that there's nothing uh, that the online students critically need coming from the classroom in order to reach the learning outcomes. And so I have to be prepared to provide those resources in, in different ways. Uh, I also ask students, uh, to give me tips for other students. You know, I can tell students, well, here's how, here's what I think you should be doing. Or when you, when you want to make a decision about whether to be online or not, here's my recommended strategy. You kind of work through this, kind of this process. 
uh, one, can you come to class? If, if so, well, uh, do you think that it will be, you know, is it useful for you to come to class, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. But I also ask students to give me tips for other students because sometimes I know our students uh, will listen to their peers, especially peers they know, um, maybe even more so than, uh, than uh, a faculty member. So there's, there's a bunch of tips from students in there. And that's one of the things I'd suggest if you do this on your own institution or even in your own class is ask your students what, what has worked well for them uh, and what they would recommend to, you know, what they would tell other students to do. Um, you know, you have to consider schedule flexibility for students. You know, how are you going to register for students? You're going to probably address this when you talk about administrative concerns. But how do students know that there are options on participating in this particular class? Uh, and so we, we, I've seen these four different um, methods used. Sometimes we list it as an online class and a face-to-face -face class. Sometimes we'll combine section. We'll, we'll take two full sections, one fully online, one fully face-to-face. -face. If we have enough student enrollment and, and assign it to one faculty member, that one faculty member that can teach both sections combined as a high flex class, get credit for teaching both classes. Uh, and yet are, they're only preparing one larger learning community kind of, you know, a learning management system site and then the integration with, with um, you know, engagement and things like that for students in that way, it kind of helps manage work workload as well. And then the online student support, for institutions like mine, we've never had fully online degree programs until now. Uh, we have three in the final stages that were in the final stages of approval by our, our accrediting agency uh, last fall. Now, ironically, everything's online. And so we are actually being forced into learning how to support fully online students as an institution, as is probably every institution, you know, almost worldwide these days. Uh, and so I think we're going to learn a lot more about aligning student support, but that's an important part that, you know, for the student experience, they have to be able to exist as a fully online student if we're going to give them that option. And that means our administrator structures have to be able to support them as well. You know, faculty factors, you know, one of the most important things is considering where faculty are starting now. We are assuming we always assume that we're doing effective online or effective classroom instruction. So we, if we can start there, right, and then move into the online environment, that's typically the design path and the kind of the faculty development path that, that we, we like to take, right? When faculty already have online teaching experience, when they already have hybrid teaching experience, you know, clearly they have, they have um, you know, that's easier for them to kind of adapt to high flex and to kind of think about how they might design for a high flex environment. You know, there are clearly, if you, you know, if you're a faculty development specialist, yeah, you know that anytime we open up a class for, for designing differently, we have an opportunity to say, well, actually, have all the things we've been doing in the classroom really been all that effective? Many, many times they have, sometimes maybe it hasn't actually been that effective, uh, but I don't go there when I'm talking with faculty because, you know, that becomes, that can become a very difficult conversation. Uh, and I'd rather have them learn that themselves as they move into a different environment and realize, well, I can't do that exactly. What's valuable about that that I have, that I want to be able to bring into the online environment. And then the next part is we talk about, well, what do we want to do? Are we doing, are we going to do this? Am I going to teach all my classes this way? Am I being told to teach this way? Am I doing this because it's my choice or because I'm responding to a, a, a you know, a, a, a perceived or a real need of students? A lot of times faculty will move this direction when their department realizes, you know, we're, especially in the graduate programs, is that well, we need a few more students in our classes. And we know that we're not available, we're not available to all students because we're face-to-face. -face. So if we open up an online option for students, we'll be able to bring in another three, four, maybe five students in a class section. So now it's a, it's a full or fuller section, uh, full enough to be that we want to be able to, you know, provide the resources to teach it when before we might have not had enough students enrollment. So that's one of the things that sometimes faculty want to do. I just need to get five more students in my class. One of the things that faculty will often do though is, is uh, not be so sure they want to teach this way. So what I would encourage them to do is often to you know, try it out, you know, take a couple of your class sessions and, and see how difficult it would be or maybe not how not difficult it would be to create an online version of that class session for students to take and then give them the opportunity to take it online to see see how it goes, get their feedback for them, ask them how, how it went and learn from that as, as you go. So the, the best approaches I've, I've seen for this kind of depends on whether it's coming from kind of grassroots faculty want to teach this way. And so they find ways to make it work. Uh, you know, they often will, will pull from our instructional design resources on ideas on how to teach this well online. 
uh, but they're also usually taking their time to do this and learning how to do it during a semester or perhaps two before they will offer a fully online or a fully high flex course. There are other situations, of course, when it becomes more of a department or a college or institution saying, we want to offer this program this way. And then it's often a multi-year process of de deciding, well, what design approaches might work for us? What can, we, what can we do? What kind of resources do we have available? How do we attract faculty? How do we get buy-in from faculty to teach this way? And, how do, and oftentimes there's a pilot process, right? So we develop this for a course or a couple of courses. We try it out, we get some feedback, we do consultation. Um, we provide more faculty development resources, perhaps to teach them, you know, to help so, or they can, so they can help, you know, kind of teach, teach each other how to do this. Uh, and then we might roll it out over two or three years. That's what most of the major um, um, programs I've seen doing this take. When we asked faculty, we just asked, I asked a couple of my colleagues to give me their feedback. This is once again from a little while ago. Uh, and they say different things about what was challenging for them. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's the, the synchronicity nature of it and the, the longing for everybody to be together in the classroom uh, because they felt most, most comfortable that way, even though it wasn't necessarily the most comfortable way for all of our students. Um, but see, some of the things that faculty will, will talk about are, I like, it the, I like the fact that when students choosing not to come to the class session, it's not like they're just choosing not to come to class because there's always class there. Uh, the class actually never ends you know, for students who are doing it asynchronously. I mean, you know, they, so, so part of the challenge is to get them to think differently about how they're taking their class, like schedule time regularly throughout the week. I, as a faculty member, have to schedule time regularly throughout the week to engage with the online students primarily uh, because I'm not getting that engagement in the classroom and I ne they need to have that engagement with me for them to reach the learning outcomes that, that we've kind of established for these classes. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's one, of the, one of the big challenges, uh, but also something I've learned to value. Uh, before it was, well, I, I get them on, let's say Tuesday night, seven o'clock to 9.30, and then next Tuesday night we come back and we're engaging again. Well, now, actually what I do now is I require all the students in my class, whether they're in class or online, to do the online discussions, right? And so what I will do is I'll take, I'll give them a little time back from the class period time and count that for online discussion time but then they're all involved in those online discussions, which makes them much better online discussions rather than four or five students. Now it's 20 students who are doing an online discussion. But it also means that I have to be more, um, you know, more, more, um, you know, I have to make sure I've got that time schedule. So I schedule roughly 30 minutes per class, three times a week into my calendar so that I know, okay, for this hour and a half, I've got three classes. I'm dedicating that time to interacting in the forums three days a week. You know, it could be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It could be a day on the weekend. Um, you know, but I, I try to make that a regular pattern so they know what to expect. And so I, and so I can kind of manage that kind of that workflow and not necessarily more work to do, but work different work to do uh, than what I might've been doing before. Well, clearly, you know, teaching now is different. So how are we gonna manage that? That's the, one of the challenges, uh, uh, you know, so you know, these other, uh, these, these challenges, I'm not sure if you've been able to get back in the classroom yet or not, um, but in, in the short term, coming back in the classroom, we still might have some of these restrictions on us. We may not be able to put everybody in the classroom. This is a challenge we've never had to face in HyFlex before, uh, where the classroom, the classroom has always been the classroom before, just like it always was. Well, now, uh, currently it's not, and who knows what it's gonna be like uh, in the spring, perhaps even in the fall of next year. Engaging students, this is one of the most important topics, and hopefully you'll have a chance to dive into this in more detail at some point. But when we talk about engagement, it's one of the kind of the, the three critical supports, I think, for student learning outcomes, right? We've got our content, we've got our assessment, and we've got our engagement. If you look at the Universal Design for Learning literature, uh, engagement is one of the important, one of the three kind of pillars in that, in that world as well. So uh, when we talk about engagement, I always want to make sure faculty think about different kinds of engagement. Because if we don't think about this, if, if this isn't part of our world, I work in the instructional design and technology world, educational psychology world, et cetera. So this is, this is important to me and it's kind of top of mind uh, a lot, but not everybody is, you know, is concerned about that. As, a, as an engineering student uh, and a technical instructor, it, quite honestly, I was often more interested in the student engaging with content than anything else, right? But the students also need to be able to engage with the instructor. Right, and the instructor also, and the students also need to be able to engage with each other. All of this contributes to the learning environment. So this is important to consider when we're talking about designing our instruction. And usually what we're doing is we're, 
we're taking uh, an effective classroom experience and trying to design for an effective online experience. What I've found is that once we start thinking about these, these uh, principles for the online students in particular, that starts bringing you know, our, our thinking back and we can start reflecting more. Well, what are we doing in the classroom actually? You know, how much interaction am I supporting in the classroom environment? How much is my presence, my teaching presence felt in the classroom uh, like I need to have it felt online? How about social presence? Do Am I supporting a socially present environment in the classroom just like I try to do or the literature is telling me I, it's important for me to do in the online environment? Uh, you know, and then cognitive presence as well. How do I support that? That's usually something that's um, we're kind of naturally thinking about that. Um, so the the community of inquiry literature uh, is some is an important part of this, and so we'll, we'll off, I'll often you know try to talk through that as well. But all of these kinds of presences are important for the educational experience, and you can obviously if you're not familiar with this, your your internal resources there probably have lots of things to say about uh, this. But essentially, cognitive presence, right? Where where students are able to access information. Right, they've got uh, a community that's uh, supporting the communication around the content, right? And so uh, it's kind of content that's designed for them to learn. Social presence. I'm doing this in a in a you know in a learning community. Uh, those of you who are who are engaged in like or who believe strongly in the kind of the social process of learning, where my interactions with others is an important part of me developing understanding and you developing understanding, um, is an important component of this. Right, and so uh, also teaching presence, right? Students have to know that there's a teacher there who is structuring the educational experience and is facilitating the, er the learning experience. You know, if, if you uh, offer an online version of your course and you're never there, our students are only there and all they get is content uh, and an opportunity to ask questions that may or may not ever get answered. Clearly that's not a very present place for you. And so it's gonna be it's going to be less of an experience. The educational experience will be much weaker than it, than it could be, right? There's also this concept of transactional distance. The point of this is that your asynchronous online course is, if it's well structured, right? And there's, um, you know, there's little dialogue. And students, the students who are going to succeed in that uh, are going to be students who have to ha who have a high degree of autonomy, right? They're they're good independent learners, right? In the classroom. Uh, oftentimes those environments have a lot more dialogue and there's a lot less structure. You know, there's kind of the flow of the class where students or you as a faculty member have a chance to kind of change and adapt and things like that. But the students who do better in those environments are ones who require less structure, right? A low, low level of individual autonomy. Uh, and so by offering, you know, an asynchronous version as well as a, a synchronous or in-class version, you actually can support students with those kind of those natural tendencies towards higher low autonomy, perhaps a little bit better. So they might find that the online environment is a better fit for their, their, their personality and the way they like to learn. And many others might find that that classroom environment is a much better fit for them. Uh, when we only offer a single mode, we're offering a mode that fits well with some students, but doesn't fit well with all students. That's the point of this. So when I talk about uh, interaction in the classroom, I want to make sure that I provide opportunity for connections for students. These are things I've done in the past. Many of these I still do, uh, but I have, a, I have a weekly forum. Even when I didn't require all students to be part of the topical discussion each week, I wanted to get an opportunity to hear from them about how the class was going, kind of a sense of the student experience every week. So I did an open online weekly reflection post for all students, You know, just a forum. They start a thread, they reply to it each week. And then over the 15 weeks of our semester, they get 15 or well, 10 to 15 probably, uh, posts that are going to built up week one, week two, week three, week four. I get a chance to see that. I let them know that, you know, I'm not going to reply to anything in there unless it's a direct question or something I have to engage with immediately. But it's really for them to reflect on their own learning process. And it gives me an opportunity for a formative evaluation uh, uh, opportunity so I can see, get a sense of, oh, look, I got, you know, a bunch of these students are telling me that this was really confusing. I need to kind of go back and relook that and kind of maybe reset that when we have class again, those kinds of things. I also encourage students to kind of flop between online and face-to-face -face if they have the opportunity, you know, to make sure that, you know, I, you can learn both ways. Uh, I support you in both ways. You're not gonna be going off into, you know, oblivion if you just do it online, you know, for a week or two or for the whole thing. Okay, well, let's see, we are, uh, we have about, uh, I don't know, 13 minutes left. There's a lot of good ideas out there about classroom engagement, especially now. 
here's a couple of resources I found very useful to kind of walk through and to try some of these ideas out. Uh, the first one is from Vanderbilt, Active Learning and Hybrid and Socially Distant Classrooms. You may have come across this, but it's a post from June uh, and it talks about, I think I have a, here it is right here. This is just the web page it goes to. But essentially uh, the director of the center there is talking about, well, here are eight or nine things that you may have done in a classroom before that you can still do in a classroom, even when you're socially distanced and even when you have online students joining you in the classroom, as well as your face-to-face -face students, you know, like fishbowl discussions or whole class discussions or small group discussions or, or jigsaw discussions, uh, those kinds of things. And so it's these kind of resources are out there. You may have some of these uh, your own. Uh, these are this is the list of I think the 10 ideas that he has uh, listed in there so that would be a good thing to kind of reference uh, I don't tell people the best way to do any of this because there you know in my mind there is no best way you know there's a lot of good ways of doing it and so you know what's best for me in a particular situation may not be best for someone else in a particular in a situation uh, LSU Louisiana State University also kind of created this uh, kind of going by based on goals you know, uh, you know, what kind of activity might you think about doing if this is your goal? And then here's how it might work online synchronous, online asynchronously, or in a physical distance classroom. And so there's a, there's a whole document there and actually encourage feedback. And so you might find that to be a useful resource as well. Um, so uh, that's uh, you know, some of the keys for the online synchronous environment. And you probably have your own, you know, ideas of what has worked well for you in the online synchronous classroom. You know, but what I've found when I'm working with students in both, both in the classroom and online, I have to make sure that I am intentionally treating the online synchronous students as if they were sitting in the classroom uh, as much as possible. So if I'm, if I'm trying to call on students to engage them in the conversation in the classroom or discussion of classroom, I want to make sure that I'm calling on just as many online synchronous students as I am classroom students, right? When we look for interaction, when we do small group breakouts, I do those all the time in classes. Well, you need to do those with the online students too. You might have enough online students to do it with their, you know, they can be their own breakout or breakouts. Uh, I try to find ways of connecting online synchronous students in breakouts with classroom students in breakouts when we have the technology to do so. So if students have their own personal technology in class and their personal AV, you know, like their earbuds and the microphone, well, then they could potentially be part of an online breakout group. Um, you know, and, 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 and which helps create this idea of we're all in this together. We're a single learning community. Um, and then using the other interactive tools, right? So you might do polls, whiteboard, et cetera. Uh, a lot of those things work, work well in classrooms. What I, what I would tell faculty is to make sure they're not doing, using technology just to do technology, right? And to find things that they're comfortable with so they can do them well. Uh, and then to rely on that and then bring in if you want to bring in lots of new technology, I would say just you know bring in one new technology and make sure that's working well. Because remember, the students who are experiencing this, you might be bringing in another technology and you've got a set of four or five different things you're using for, for inter interaction. And for you, maybe that's fine. But if your students aren't used to that, then for them, it might be four or five new things to learn all at once. And that's, that's going to be, there's going to be an additional kind of cognitive load, right? Uh, that uh, they're going to have to be able to go through and learn it. So they're focusing on learning the technology as well as kind of the content that you're talking about. Lots of other resources out there. Uh, this is one that I'd like to refer to from DePaul around facilitating discussions in class and online. Um, you know, and I find that you know principles of good discussions in the classroom are often uh, also principles of good discussion discussion online. Although there are oftentimes also also you know um, uh, process differences that have to be taken into account, like the whole timing nature of an online discussion in an asynchronous um, uh, forum. You're not going to have students, you know come up with an answer in 20 minutes of discussion because that 20 minutes of discussion interactive wise might actually be spread over three or four days or maybe a whole week compared to what you can do in a classroom so think about what think about those situations all right um we uh jamie is there any questions are, are there any questions we should address now there's yeah, a lot have, more of this you can go through on your own later and ask questions about yeah brian i have uh I think about four questions that have been asked throughout the, uh, the presentation today. So I'm going to go back to a question from Greg Ketchum, where he asked, um, are there any published studies on video technology uh, that you select and uh, student sense of community and social presence? Yeah, there are. As a matter of fact, if you go to um, 
let me uh, let me take let me back go back to uh, uh, let's go to um, let me show you show you the book site. If you take a look at this, and there's two two areas of um, uh, let's see if I got this right. Two areas of the book that would be pretty helpful for you. This is the book. It's easy to find at techbooks.org. Whoops. Oh, what did I do with that? All right. But if you go to, uh, there's a section here called Evaluating the Impact of Hybrid Flexible Courses and Programs, this chapter 2.5. In here, I've picked out, I think, 13 studies. Uh, and these are studies that I found in the literature that were relevant in some particular way. You know, what start, started it out and then some other kinds of things. So some, almost all of them talk about student satisfaction and looking at student learning outcomes, often grades to make sure there's no difference, or at least there's no, there's no, uh, they're no worse in hybrid uh, or high flex. But there are also other ones that look at student, student, the student experience more, all right, uh, which is best for students as far as their interact, their perceived um, presence and things like that. And so this, take a look through these, that can be helpful. But then the other, the other thing I wanted to point you to was this appendix, which is the bibliography we put together. There's about 82 different articles, uh, book chapters, dissertations, uh, master's theses, et cetera, listed in here. And so you will probably be able to find, um, you know, some relevant works in this, in this list as well. Um, and I didn't write all of these, of course. So, so you'll find a lot of variety in here. Now, admittedly, this is all, this is all like pre-COVID. I know there's a lot of work going on now. I know that I'm, I'm sitting on a couple of dissertations now that are looking at specifically high flex in our current environment and hopefully in the next uh, next year. And so there'll be a lot more work coming out on this. All right. And so uh, you'll, what you'll find is that uh, there are the places that have invested in the higher technology will often do, they're doing it for a purpose. And the purpose they want to do is to increase the sense of uh, teacher presence and, you know, to online students as if it was a closer to like a classroom experience. And so that's usually the kinds of things that they're looking for. And most of them find that there is some, that there is some difference there. Um, but there comes at a, you know, there's a, there's a cost to that. There's a, there's a technical cost. There's also the using technology in the context of teaching cost uh, and the, the increased mediation of technology for students. And sometimes they're looking at, well, how do we reduce, you know, make it so that the technology you know, it's more, you, you know, feels like it's not even there, right? Um, and so those are the kinds of things that they're often looking for. So I, that's where I would do is point you to these, uh, these studies. Great, thanks, Brian. And then we have another question from Jay. How do you educate the students on the tools that they need uh, to choose HyFlex, the best practices before they enroll? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, many of us have used, when we've talked about, you know, just online courses, I, I don't know, you may be familiar with those surveys uh, that have students, you know, we ask them, you know, are you ready for an online course, right? And so we'll have them do a survey and I'll ask them, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20 or 30 questions and it will give them an answer at the end saying, well, you know, here's some areas where you may not be ready for an online course. And I've always wondered of, of the students who took those surveys, who found that they weren't a good candidate for an online course, whether or not that made any difference in the making that choice. And so I, will st I still will point students to that as one way to help them make a decision about how they should be participating. So they at least know that, hey, guess what? Our, our best wisdom overall says that you, you, you may not have good um, uh, time management skills. And that's gonna be a challenge for you when you choose to be an online student in the class. But I also think that they're still gonna make that choice. Many of them at least are still gonna make that choice because they often are not making choices based on what's best for them or what they're prepared for. They're often making those choices based on convenience, right? I had, I've had students who live on campus in the dorms, you know, not 300 feet from my classroom who will never come into a classroom because they just don't want to come into the classroom. You know, they're, they're, it's not even in, well, it's inconvenient to them, but not as, as in like, it's going to take me a long time or cost me a lot of money to get there. But they're still making that choice. And so what I, what I try to do then is just to make sure I'm designing the synchronous online experience in a way that uh, even the student who's making that choice based completely on convenience isn't getting one. It's not an easier path. It should be an equivalent path. So that's one of the things we try to do is look at the rigor in each path to make sure that we're asking students to do a, re a reasonably similar amount of work. Uh, and two, to try to make that as interesting to them as possible. I can't make it interesting you know, to every student uh, necessarily, uh, you know, but some of the things I try to do is to personalize it as much as I can. So, 
uh, where where you know I let them I want them to tell stories I want them to bring in their own experiences and those kinds of things so not, no matter what I'm teaching I try to make sure that there's this personal element in the online and that tends to make it more interesting for many students although they'll still be students who, who are choosing otherwise um, and then I focus really on okay I have to be satisfied if, I, if I'm able to help them reach the learning outcomes even if they are doing it in a disinterested way some of the students will just be that way you know so I do the best I can but uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, they still have to make that choice. It's there's a volitional choice in there, isn't there? Great. And we have another question from Bill Hollister, uh, where he thanks you for your presentation and then asks, I'm curious if students have ever taken issue with the fact that they're being recorded. Also, have you ever found it difficult or impossible at times to create equivalent experiences between in-person and online environments? I would ask the same question regarding assessment in particular. Right. Yeah, that those are those are those are great questions. Uh, I've never had students who've told me they were uncomfortable being recorded. However, I know that the fact that I often record may change some of the way they interact in class. And so, one of the things I've found that I've had to rely on more than expected is our breakout rooms. Uh, when I'm especially now when I'm teaching fully synchronously, uh, well, synchronously and asynchronously, I didn't expect that before. Um, because the breakout rooms are not recorded for us. I don't record the breakout rooms. And so when I get them in the breakout rooms, they're much, they're, they know they're not being recorded. And it's not like they're talking about things totally off subject. They just seem to be more free to one, show their videos, right? Their, their face on the screen, as well as be in, engaged in active uh, conversations in the class. And so I use those um, as, much as, I, as much as it makes sense. Um, so yeah, uh, on our campus, uh, and actually there are some situations where I'll turn the video off and I'll let them know that we're not going to record this conversation. And, it's, and sometimes it's because we want to talk about things going on campus or whatever. So well, look, let's just take the recording off the table. Um, and so that hasn't been an issue. I try and also let them know, you know, the recording is only available inside the firewall of the classroom, the, you know, LMS. And um, uh, we do that as well. There are other faculty though who are teaching uh, classes and they have more sensitive topics they're talking about and so they all they often won't record at all and I think that's fine you don't have to record in order to 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 provide an asynchronous experience that helps students reach learning outcomes they just don't have that that, that the opportunity to listen to that that kind of conversation um, okay so and then so yeah there are some times when one of the things I do when I work with faculty the first thing we'll do once we, once we talk about okay what is high flex and is this a strategic direction you think you might want to head the first thing we do is we talk about student learning outcomes. Can you realistically help students meet these learning outcomes in an asynchronous or a fully online environment, could be synchronous, uh, uh, compared to the classroom? And if the answer is no, well, then, the, then usually the, the decision is, okay, well, either one, we don't do high flex with this. If there's no good online path here, there's no good online path here, right? And so, it's, or it's too hard for us to do. Yeah, we could do this if we had some sort of complicated deep simulation we could do. We don't have the money for that. We don't have the time for that. So we're not gonna do that. So we might not do that for at all for a class, or we might say, okay, well, just like we would in another class, maybe it's a hybrid environment where it's high flex part of the time, you know, maybe half the class, we can actually meet these outcomes in class or online, but maybe there's another half of the class. Maybe it's complicated lab scenarios where you have to be here to do this, right? So, so that kind of approach also works really well in many situations. We're, we're doing this now on our campus, as a matter of fact. We have, a, we have a handful of classes that are allowed on campus and it's almost always because we cannot, we cannot find a way to do this well online. You know, uh, you know a, a science lab, that's, that's not something that's easily to replace with an online lab or a performance environment where, you know, if we're gonna offer this class, you have to be able to come here to do some sort of a, of a, like an ensemble music group or something like that. Those kinds of situations. Or another one that also, also comes up is the ceramics lab. Right, where you have to come to students, you know, come to campus and fire your uh, work in a kiln. Uh, those kinds of things, we would say, well, there's no way we're going to do that online. And so we have to be able to come to some adaptations for that. On the assessment side, I think it's different. I think that, you know, um, in most, almost every situation, there are ways to find uh, situations where you can do assessment in both modes. I like to try to move all the assessment to the online mode if I can, because then it's, the, then it's an equal place, at least environmentally, for students, at least coming from an external perspective, right? So if I have an in-class test environment and an online test environment, that's two different environments. And even if you're using online proctoring, uh, it's still a little bit of a different environment. So there's always that question about, uh, you know, equity, uh, you know, is it, are the, you know, how, how equal are these environments and how much is that impacting students' scores? 
So I will try to move everything into an online. So even if I have students in the classroom, I still might use the online environment for the test um, because then at least it's all in the kind of that online environment. On our campus, we're not using the online remote proctoring uh, by vendors. We will allow faculty to do their own proctoring online for tests if they want to do that. Uh, but we, we have kind of restricted them from doing the, the third party vendor uh, solutions for proctoring. So what we're trying to do is try to get faculty to think about writing tests differently so proctoring is not as important because the likelihood of teaching is, is maybe a little bit less, right? Randomizing questions, randomizing answers, uh, doing different kinds of assessments, you know, authentic assessment, but even if you're doing uh, tests to lower the stakes, you know, add more tests, add more quizzes, build a grade over the whole class rather than 70% final, 30% midterm or some, something like that, which tends to create a lot of pressure for students on, on individual test performance. So yeah, those are the, some of the challenges that we find. Um, and there's a whole section on assessment in, in the slides that we didn't get a chance to get to that might be helpful to help you think through some things. Great. And then just one final question uh, that kind of you touched on slightly in your response to Bill there. Uh, when a, a course is offered using all modalities, but uh, students aren't provided an option to choose on the fly, what's your preferred name for this modality? Um, do you have any comments about pro or con about this limitation? Yeah, uh, well, I think that there may be some good reasons. I, I'm actually, I talk about restricting the online environment in particular for some students and situations. For example, international students, we may not be able to allow them to, we might want to give them the option to take this class, but it's only offered high flex. Well, if, if they've already taken another online class, we might have some visa requirements that restrict them from doing it online. So for them, it might be, you have to be here in the classroom. This is not an online option for you. And so there's, there are situations like that. Another situation comes up if I have a student who wants to take it, but has proven an inability to manage their, their online uh, you know, class successfully. That kind of student, uh, I would feel comfortable with saying, well, you know, for you, we're, you know, as long as we all know ahead of time, you know, this, this is the arrangement, you're going to be an in-class student. Um, or maybe there are students who, who you don't know. And so maybe, maybe there's, maybe they have to kind of earn their way to do it for that flexibility. So there's a lot of different varieties that can be done. A lot of it depends upon why, the, why you're doing it in the first place and what the institutional perspective is on this. Um, but I would call it more, if I wasn't going to give them the choice week to week, I'd call it more like multimodal, uh, comodal, something like that. Because I wouldn't put the word flexibility in there if there really was no flexibility. And to call it high flex in particular, I think it has to have at least one online and a face-to-face -face, and the students have to be able to choose on a weekly basis as much. Sometimes I'll use, I've used the term hybrid high flex too, but you know, you know, at some point it's like, well, how many different words can I string together here and still, still, <laughs> still have it make sense. That's great. Does anybody else have any other questions for Brian? I think I've exhausted the questions there that are there in the chat. while we're waiting there. Uh, Lisa, you have a question? Yeah, I actually was just wondering um, what format you use for discussions, because I've been pretty unsatisfied with yeah. um, the ones I've tried. Yeah, I used to, I tried to use a variety of, uh, of uh, I mean, the simplest for me, when the way, I, the way I started it, the first time I did this, the first time I really did online discussions, it was pretty standard. It was like, okay, do the readings, come up, you know, three major points or whatever. And that, you know, that might work once or a couple of times in a semester, especially with grad students, you might assume, but still it's not very engaging. And even as a faculty member, it's not all that engaging because you're saying the same thing over and over again. Um, so I try to add, I, tr I try to always have them connect something to their own experience. I, 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 I try to bring, have them bring in their own stories into whatever they're responding to. There are sometimes where I'll have the students in the class come up with the discussion prompts. That might be actually be an assignment it depended upon the students in the class but that might be the thing is okay maybe maybe two or three of you will work together and this week of the semester you are going to be facilitating that discussion which means you come up you hear the readings we're going to be doing or here's the content come up with a prompt and then you facilitate it with your colleagues and i find what happens is so a lot of students will will participate more when students are managing the conversation in part because there's this there's this social peer thing going on where they don't want to be the ones who are no one talks to when it's their time to do the discussion, right? So there are different ways of doing that, but you can also, there are also lots of different um, approaches, doing debates, role plays, uh, the kinds of things. And that, that um, uh, the resource I linked to for um, the DePaul University is one example. There's other things linked in there. I think uh, there's, a, there's a book by Kurt Bonk and, and colleagues 
uh, around interactivity in online environments. And he has, you know, people like that have lots and lots of different ideas on how to do like 101 interactive online discussions. So there's a lot of, a lot of things. I, I think the thing to do is to use variety uh, and to try to do some things that you wouldn't have thought of yourself. Uh, and then also try to bring the students into it as much as possible, you know. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Anybody else have questions for Brian? We're a little bit past time here. <laughs> I want to extend my, my thanks uh, on behalf of the Center for Professional Development to Brian uh, for joining us today. This was really helpful to get the conversation started about HyFlex here at SUNY um, and, and for us to kind of explore it from multiple angles. So I appreciate your time here today. Thanks, mm -hmm, Brian. Good. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I always like talking to people about uh, high flex, especially to just starting on this, uh, starting on this journey. Yeah. Do it thoughtfully, yeah. right? You can do it well, um, but it's not, it's not for everybody, you know, uh, you know, well, I guess maybe unless you're told to do so, but even then it's not for everybody. Um, but I do think that in the long run, you know, as we, one of the things that we're looking at here is, is create a more equitable environment for our students. And we know that the fully asynchronous environment isn't the best for everybody. We know the fully synchronous environment is not the best for everybody, but we also know the classroom is not the best for everybody. And so, so my, my hope is that we, we provide options that, that provide them, you know, at least two, maybe three of these, these, poss these possibilities participation. If we can do all that well, I think we provide more access to, to good quality uh, education for more of our students. So that's my long-term goal. Great. Well, we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Uh, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day out there in California. And for those 